Okay, let's get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's CNCF webinars, K-8 Auditing in Depth. My name is Jerry Fallon and I will be hosting today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Randy Apernefi, Managing Partner at RxM. We just have a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Randy for today's presentation. Randy, your mic is on mute. Hey, thanks a lot for that. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome. Um, uh, this is uh, the Kate's Auditing in Depth session. A um, bunch of interesting stuff to take a look at. Um, over the next half hour or so. So uh, why don't we go ahead and just jump right in. All right. So my name is Randy Abernathy. Um, I'm a cloud native geek of the first order. Um, I'm a big fan of microservices and Apache thrift and things in that area. And um, I work for RxM and we're, you know, um, dyed in the wool cloud native folks over here. It's just a quick note on me. The session today is gonna cover um, auditing. And we're gonna we're gonna start from the start and go through some of the basics, but we're gonna quickly move into more advanced concepts, and we're gonna talk about um, some of the challenges and issues with um, multiple API servers and mutating admission controller webhooks, and um, how to deal with different audit log backends in uh, scenarios where you have you know kind of massive throughput requirements, and you know what exactly um, you can expect from audit logging um, from a uh, throughput and capacity standpoint. So. Um, let's, uh, let's start off, um, you know, audit, what is audit logging? If we just start at the very start. Well, um, the definition of audit is an official inspection of an individual's or organization's accounts, um, typically by an independent body. And, um, this is a, you know, kind of an interesting parallel to what Kubernetes auditing is. And you can see the, the, uh, the context sentence, I think is actually even more telling audits can be expected to detect, uh, can't be expected to detect every fraud. So this is exactly the spirit of auditing in Kubernetes. Logging um, happens in, um, in services that you run in Kubernetes, including the control plane services, like your you know, con controller manager, the scheduler, the API server, um, kubelets, and so on. And they all um, log to standard out, standard error. And if you're a system D service, that's gonna be manageable through journal, CUDL, and all that stuff. If you're actually running in a pod, as you may, if you're um, running, you know, kind of a kubeadm style setup for your your control plane, then um, kubectl logs would be able to show you the log output of these different services, and it can be managed with, you know, um, plugins that forward the logs off the back ends, low key, Elasticsearch, what have you. Um, and then you've also got events taking place inside the cluster control plane events, and those events are going to be um, visible. Um, through kubectl get events, for example, or if you describe an object, you'll be able to see information about it. But this is a different beast, auditing, right? Auditing is designed to um, give you the ability to inspect um, an individual or organization's accounts, um, right? Um, and to um, be able to detect activity that might be fraudulent, for example. Some of the other um, verb uses here, companies must have their accounts audited. He made use of knowledge gleaned from economics class he audited. So um, being able to watch and oversee something, right, is sort of the idea of the audit log. And it's a, you know, it's different in kind because what it's designed to do is capture um, the who, what, and whys of activity going on in the cluster. And it's usually at a far um, more granular level than these other types of logs. Right, application level logging that you get in standard out and standard error is going to be things like, you know, um, I created this, I did that, I did this other thing. Um, and some of the details may be um, obscured for security reasons or something like that. But an audit log 
is designed to capture um, all of the details. Uh, it is designed for no holds barred inspection of what's going on in the cluster. And so, you know, generally um, only, you know, privileged individuals should be looking at the audit log because it can expose a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you can, you can look at the exact manifest posted by every user for all of the resources that they're creating. You can see the responses in detail from the cluster um, and so on and so forth. So um, it's really a, you know, a function like you would have a security audit. Um, that's really what the audit log is for. It's for facilitating those types of activities. So let's start off with just uh, some of the basics. This is the definition straight out of the Cates IO docs. Kubernetes auditing um, provides a security relevant chronological set of records documenting the sequence of activities by individual users, administrators, or other components affecting the system. So an interesting thing about the audit log is that not only are you looking at the actions of users, administrators, or otherwise, but you're also seeing the interaction from the, the system principles within the cluster. So you're going to see activity from kubelets and from controller managers and schedulers. And in this way, you can use the audit log as um, a great way to get an in-depth understanding of how your cluster is actually operating. And in fact, um, you know, how frequently, um, you know, certain types of activities are taking place. And so, you know, you can always go and dig around in config files and things like that to sort of figure out how things are set up and what they're doing. But going to the horse's mouth is always, you know, the authoritative answer because you might see a configuration file that says this thing's supposed to happen every five minutes and you look at the audit log and it's happening every three seconds. Well, that's putting a lot of load on the control plane. Maybe you want to look into why that is. Is it because the config file is mistyped? Is it because uh, there's a default that um, is, uh, is at play in some scenarios where there isn't a config file? You know, there's, there's all sorts of interesting things you can glean from digging through the audit log. So it can be used for, um, you know, for security professionals and forensics and things like that, but it can also be used for cluster debugging and performance tuning. And um, it's a, you know, just a, a really all around powerful facility. So if we were to look at the, um, the architecture um, picture of the audit log, it probably looks something like this. Um, all roads lead to the API server. The API server is the state manager for the cluster at the end of the day. It's the microservice that owns all of the metadata describing what the cluster is doing. Now, the API servers are stateless themselves, but they have the logic that is um, there to handle authentication, authorization, admission control, and all of these types of things that decide whether uh, uh, something that uh, an end user would like to create as a specification is going to be accepted or not. Now, if that um, specification is accepted, it's going to be um, dropped into etcd. So etcd is a highly consistent key value store sitting behind the API server. And you know this is a simplified model. You would generally have multiple API servers and a cluster of etcd nodes, but the communications channels are the same, right? Everybody talks to the API server, and only the API server talks to etcd. And so if you want to know the status of something, if you want to create something, delete something, update something, modify something, you do it through the API server. So essentially, the API server is the gatekeeper of all you know, configuration and status for the cluster. When the kubelets, um, which are the node agents running out there in the cluster nodes, report in um, the activity that they're seeing, the status of their memory and CPU consumption, the specifications that they're um, maintaining for pods and containers, all of that stuff's being dumped into the API server and dropped into etcd. So if we enable the API server to log all of this activity at the API level, and since the API server's API is the gateway to all state in, in the Kubernetes cluster, um, then you know, we're, we're really creating a, a place where we can see everything happening. Now, it's not completely true. It's, it is a distributed system. You know, kubelets keep a cache of the pods that they're supposed to be running. And, and there are, you know, little pockets of information throughout the system. But at the end of the day, um, if, if the API server is right and good, most things in your cluster are going to be right and good. And if there's something wrong, um, the API server is going to be able to see that um, in most cases. So it's the perfect place to be capturing this kind of detailed logging. Now, when you run an API server by default, there is no audit log. 
and so we don't have this facility. It's therefore very good to know that the audit log exists and to start thinking ahead and saying, hey, um, today we don't need the audit log, but after something catastrophic happens, it's too late, right? <laughs> you wanna see what caused this big problem and you have no, um, no record of the activity. So there's a lot of different um, ways we might wanna configure audit logging because um, audit logging can range from non-existence, so uh, no load at all, to um, capturing every single thing that comes and goes from the API server, which is gonna be a lot heavier. Um, when you think about the, the, the cluster picture that you see here, you can, you can quickly rationalize you know, kind of, a, 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 the, the amount of activity that's gonna be coming into the API server. If you imagine that you've got a, a maximal sized cluster, uh, currently upstream Kubernetes is 5,000 nodes, right? So if you've got a 5,000 node cluster, you've got 5,000 kubits reporting status to the API server on a regular basis. You've got reconciliation loops in the configuration managers um, looking at all of those deployments and services. And, um, and as pods come and go, they get evicted because one node gets a little bit uh, tight on memory and they pop up somewhere else. You've got the scheduler moving things around. And imagine you maybe have um, you know, 10 pods per node in a 5,000 node cluster, that's 50,000 pods. And that might equate to something like 5,000 deployments and 5,000 services and um, 50,000 endpoints for all of those services. And that's a, lot of, that's a lot of just quiescent activity, even though nothing might be happening um, in the cluster driven by users, the, the, the reporting and the constant reconciliation, the self-healing behaviors that, that Kubernetes is performing all the time can create massive you know, flows of messages into the audit log, depending on how you've got it tuned. So um, the API server is really the centerpiece. Um, all the requests to view or modify state go through that API server. And so it's the central place where we wanna do auditing. Um, so what's in the audit log? Well, it tells you what happened. So if I, for example, uh, create a pod or create a deployment or create a service, um, that's going to be recorded. It's going to record when it happened. So the, the API server will timestamp the audit log event, they're called. Um, it's going to specify who initiated it. So it'll capture my identity. Um, and this is um, very detailed. So if I am an administrator and I'm impersonating another user, um, when I create this pod, it'll capture both of those identities, the, my identity and the, the party I'm impersonating. Um, so what object did this happen on? So the pod, the deployment, whatever, you can get the exact um, uh, identity of that object. And uh, where was it observed? So as um, information you know, is, is being processed by the API server, we have different uh, stages um, and so on. And then from where was it initiated? Um, where did this uh, request come in from and, and where is it going? So if there's any destination for this thing um, that can also be identified in the audit log. So an example of an audit event um, might look something like this. And as you can see here, we're just tailing the, um, the audit log file and just grabbing one line. And the modern audit log is JSON based. So the old audit logging, um, which is deprecated at this point, legacy audit logging was a uh, text-based format. And so audit events were a single line, but the current uh, approach is JSON, which is a lot easier to parse and process and store and search and index and all that kind of stuff. So um, if we just um, clean, clean up the formatting and you know, space it and indent it a little bit there with JQ, um, our JSON query tool, we get a nice dump like this. And so you can see this looks a lot like a Kubernetes resource. Um, a, a Kubernetes, um, you know, manifest uh, or a Kubernetes uh, spec. And so it, it follows the same exact principles as everything else in Kubernetes, where it is kind of a sort of a declarative approach with key value pairs and, um, you know, support for nesting and collections and things like that. And so any Kubernetes object that you would um, try to create would have a kind. And so that's the type of thing it is. This is an event. However, um, the kind of a thing doesn't um, create a unique definition. And this is because um, parties can, um, can create custom resources, for example. And so if, um, if my company, let's say RxM creates a, an event type of resource, and then let's say um, you know, another company 
creates an event type of resource, how would you disambiguate? Well, there's a, an API um, group that you would organize those kinds under. And so as you can see here, this is an audit Kate's IO um, based event. And it also has a version. So it takes three pieces to put together a complete um, you know, kind, actually. You need the, the group, you need the, um, the kind itself, which is subordinate to the group, and then you need the version. And so there are other types of events, and this can be confusing to people first getting into audit logging. The typical Kubernetes event that you deal with is a control plane event that is not an audit event. So um, there are different kinds of events. Keep an eye on that API group to know which type of event you're dealing with. And um, then these guys have, um, they've got uh, a number of other bits of information, which makes them a little bit different from a typical um, Kubernetes resource. Generally, Kubernetes resources um, would support metadata and the object um, in question would have a name. So these events um, have, um, you know, they have identity, um, you know, per se, but they, they're not named, right? They're just events in a stream. And so it's not like a pod that would have a, a name. And um, also you'll note that these events aren't labeled, right? They're emitted only. We don't create them. They're um, an artifact of activity in the, in the cluster. And so um, they're created by the API server in a stream as things happen. And they're, so they're, they're a little bit different. Um, from your trad traditional resource, but the, the format is kind of similar. Now you will note down at the bottom here that we have annotations and these are um, just exactly like annotations in a typical Kubernetes resource. They give us the ability to expand on the functionality of the audit log event without um, damaging the overall spec. So for example, if you create a pod and you want to tell, um, you know, some, oh, uh, let's say some, some CNI plugin, something special, like maybe the CNI plugin has some tricky uh, dual networking functionality and you want to tell it to put you on the B network, you could use an annotation. Kubernetes doesn't know anything about multiple networks, but by plugging an annotation in there, you're creating a key value pair that Kubernetes basically passes around everywhere, but just ignores. And so all of the plugin components and extension points in Kubernetes are often going to use these annotations to, um, uh, to, to, to augment the functionality of a particular thing. And so in the case of audit logging, that's exactly true. So if we have, for example, um, an admission controller that we've um, added to our cluster through a webhook, well, Kubernetes can um, create audit events around, hey, this thing got denied because the pod security policy denied it. But if the, um, if the webhook, um, that is not part of Kubernetes denies this, we need to you know, maybe have some, some reasons why, or if it mutates the request, we might wanna know what the mutation was and all those types of things can be represented in annotations. So annotations are really, um, really give us a lot of flexibility here. Um, some other things um, that you'll note that we're gonna talk about in a second are that there are stages of processing. And so you can, record events at um, a given stage of processing or multiple stages of processing, if you like. Um, we have a, you know, the user as we described and who, who was involved here. So this is um, this particular node. So that's the host name of the node um, that, um, that made this um, API get request. And um, you can also see the, the uh, URL. Um, so this was the request API. So this, this particular node was getting the uh, API v1 nodes information on itself, um, which it is allowed to do. Um, and it is going to do on a, on a regular basis, right? To get, get any um, you know, kind of updated information about itself. This is an interesting thing about Kubernetes, right? You have to remember that when you submit a specification to Kubernetes, the API server basically verifies it from a security standpoint and then dumps it into etcd. There is no guarantee that that means it's gonna be okay or work, right? And so, um, things asynchronously then kick off after that, like the scheduler assigns pods to nodes. And if there's no node available, your pod might be pending. If the pod does end up on node, but you know, the, the image that you've specified in the pod is no good, um, that's gonna cause the kubelet to not be able to pull the image and it's not gonna run again. But in all cases, as far as the API server was concerned, the spec was good and it saved it to etcd. So you have to also 
have you know a, a fair amount of understanding of Kubernetes to be able to follow through with some of these events because um, the ways that you would find out these other things would be after the fact, right? The user posted that pod spec, sure, and there was no errors, but that doesn't mean it's okay. The scheduler might might um, attempt to do something and report that it couldn't be scheduled. The kubelet might um, report a status of uh, image pull, you know, um, you know, fallback, um, and you know, be be uh, be failing to to pull the image and, and continually retrying and reporting that. So you can find lots of different pieces of the puzzle and wiring that all together um, is, is definitely a skill that you develop through practice. So, um, you know, one would suggest then that if you're going to, if you, if you find that audit logging is gonna be an important part of your, you know, operational environment, um, working with audit logs and starting to craft, um, uh, you know, some experience and, and um, dashboards and things like that through your back end you know, um, log management systems, whatever they may be, Splunk or uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, you know, uh, Grafana on, on Loki or, or whatever it is, um, you know, getting getting prepared and developing some skills ahead of time can really pay dividends when you're in a, um, a, a scenario where there's a, a failure or um, some security event that you need to deal with. So what is the definition of the fields in the audit event and, and, and how are they all organized? Well, that's a good question. And um, I'm just gonna pull up uh, something that you're probably familiar with here. I'll go to kates.io slash docs and um, pull up the reference here. So if you wanna know what's, you know, how to specify resources, the API for Kubernetes is essentially this, these JSON documents, right? I mean, you, you, you get post, put, and delete these things, but all of the activity that's taking place is in response to these documents. And so, as I mentioned, um, if I go ahead and search for event and we look down the left-hand side here, you can see that there's a metadata API and there's an event defined there, but this is part of the core group, right? Any, anytime you, you don't have a, a group name, and so for example, let me just go over here to a cluster and do a cube CTL uh, API resources. Right, so these these are all the API resources um, known um, to the um, to this particular API server, and so these are things you can post, you know, and put and 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 delete uh, through the API server API. But you'll see that there's a bunch of these resource types pods, you know, the early guys that were there with version one that don't have an API group. That's the core group. So those guys are always in the core group, and then you've got a bunch of these guys that have different groups. Um, depending on you know which which working group is um, is managing those those particular resources, and you'll note that if we look for events, you can see that we've got events and event right events.kates.io. So this is a completely different group. It's an it's a not the same resource as the the audit log resource. It's not part of the API, right? It's these are just a format for audit, um, you know, uh, information being emitted. So you know we're kind of stranded here because if we, you know, you can search around and you're just, you know, you're going to find these are legacy, um, right, old API versions. So there's just there's no uh, there's no information here. Uh, there's there's uh, limited um, information about. Um, the format of the API events and things like that. And so whenever you're in doubt, you know, go to the sources because Kubernetes being open source is a huge benefit. Um, the quality of the code in Kubernetes is pretty dang high because there's, a, there's you know, this, all of this governance involved in, you know, how changes are made and, um, you know, reviews and, you know, minimum requirements for documentation and um, in, in the code. And so as you can see here, um, all we really need to do is go to Kubernetes in GitHub and, um, you know, move down to the API server package and then look in the audit v1 types go and you're going to find um, definitions of all of the types of things that the audit subsystem uses. So you'll find information, for example, here on the event struck and, you know, every single field is um, described and you can, of course, even see the data types that are being used here, um, which if you can read Go, which isn't that hard to ingest if you know any programming language really, um, you got a, a leg up. So 
um, getting detailed um, definitions for events in all the different fields you can find here. If you're running into something that you're not familiar with, but let's cover a few of the key things. Um, API servers, um, you know, process requests in stages. And so they authenticate users, they authorize uh, users, they admit uh, resources um, as a final stage in the security processing, and there's other things that happen as well. And so um, from an, a, an audit standpoint, um, receiving the request um, is something that we can log if we want to. This is the first stage. This is generated as soon as the audit handler receives the request. And so if, you, if you're interested in you know, every single request that's made, um, that's, that's a stage. Next, uh, the response started. So this is after the response headers are sent, but before the response body is sent. So this would apply to like uh, long running requests, like a watch request or something like that. Um, and then response complete. Um, again, this is the response body complete. So after there's no bytes left to send. And then there are also, um, you know, in, in, in Go programming, a panic means um, something pretty catastrophic has happened. And while you might be able to um, recover from that, most of the times that means that the, you know, the API server would, would crash. So um, pretty serious. So those are some stages that you can um, see identified in the events. And you can also use these stages for um, filtering events too, as we'll see. So audit levels control the level of data emitted for an event. None means um, you're not gonna log anything. Um, this is the default. So if there's no policy specifying what to do, nothing's gonna happen. Then you've got metadata. So this is basically going to log all the, um, you know, the high level stuff, um, like the, the header type of information that you would have in an in a HTTP site sort of exchange. So it's going to log the, um, the user, the timestamp, um, resource information, the verb used. So you can basically see what's going on, but you won't be able to see the details. So you wouldn't be able to see, for example, you'd see that somebody's creating a particular pod, but you wouldn't see what the pod spec is. Now that's gonna do two things. Um, by sticking with metadata, you're gonna be able to see broad activity in your cluster. You're gonna be able to know what kinds of things are happening and, and which objects they're happening to. But you won't have the details. You won't know specifically you know, when this thing happened or when that thing happened or when the next thing happened um, in, insofar as mutation of a pod, for example. Um, where if you go with request, that's gonna give you the request body. Um, but you won't know what the response is gonna be. Um, if you're gonna, if you're going to capture the request, which is often, um, you know, a, a, a big piece of the puzzle, um, then um, you might want to think about capturing the response as well, so that you can see the um, the response body coming back. Though, again, you know, if there's a lot of activity on your cluster that's looking things up constantly, then the responses could be large, and that could, you know, you know, not not just incrementally, but you know, potentially multiplicatively increase the the amount of logging. So each of these gives you progressively more log output, and that means you're going to have to have more capacity and throughput in your log, um, you know, uh, uh, function. So however you've got your your logging managed. Um, so here's the audit policy. So an audit policy is again a lot like a you know a typical Kubernetes resource, and it is saved in a file and provided to the um, to the API server in order to allow it to um, you know, uh, decide what kind of auditing you'd like to do. And the audit policy file is incredibly powerful. It allows you to really get very, very um, specific about the types of things that you want to capture. So um, for example, um, you've got high level um, uh, specifications that you can add like omit request received stage. So um, that's, you know, that's sort of a, a, a global policy. Then you've got individual rules and these rules specify the level. So in this case, res request response down here, metadata down here, none. And then you've got um, the resources. Um, and so you've got the group. So this is the core group, right? Empty string is core group. If you wanted to, um, you know, reference apps, you know, um, you'd put apps in there or if it was, um, networking.cates.io, you'd put that in there. And then you've got the resource types. And this is, a, of course, a list. So you could have as many resource types from the core group that, as you'd like to specify here. Um, as we move down, you can see that you can even choose specific resource names. So if you want to, um, for example, make sure um, that we're not logging um, config maps, 
then we could specify this specific config map by name uh, is not to be logged. And then we've got scenarios where we're picking in specific users um, from the list. So, uh, you know, logging activity from the queue proxy in this case and, and specifying the verbs that we're interested in, well, in this case, not logging. And so maybe there's a lot of activity in your, in your log that you've identified as not being um, pertinent in the scenarios that you want to be able to do forensics around, you can, um, you know, you can sometimes carve out 10, 20, 30, 40% of the, you know, of the IO by just carefully um, blocking off um, certain bits of logging using um, level nine. So uh, really useful, um, useful tool and, you know, you know, very, very powerful and, and gives you lots of granular control. So again, where do we get the, the details? Um, this is not a Kubernetes um, API server resource. It's, a, it's an audit subsystem configuration file. So um, again, if we go to types, you can see all of the different settings for a policy rule, which is, you know, the main thing that you're going to construct. And if you look through here in the types, you'd see the, you know, the policy rule list and the audit policy um, types and, and all that. But you know, the rules are kind of the interesting one. And so you've got the users, um, component of the rule, for example, user groups. Um, and if you're familiar with RBAC, if you've done any um, Kubernetes security, and I would say that, that that's almost a prerequisite to you know, working with the audit log. If you're in this space and you're doing this kind of stuff, you, you may be a security professional or that's a hat you wear. And so audit logging um, involves similar types of constructs, right? You are, um, you're in RBAC going to give a particular principle, a user, a group, or a service account, some um, uh, capability, so some verb um, on some object, so some resource type. And those resource types, again, can be scoped by um, the, uh, the group, and then they can even be scoped down to a, a specific named resource and then a kind. And so that just kind of carries on here. So if you're familiar with, uh, with RBAC, um, the audit rules are, are very similar. So um, as we mentioned, auditing is not cheap. Um, it increases the memory consumption of the API server. Remember, from the model that we saw, only the API server is involved in, um, in auditing. So you, know, you don't really have to worry about the activity from you know, the controller managers or the other guys. It's, it's really the API server. And so um, you know, topping your system, getting some baselines of your server without auditing, and then you know, maybe progressively ratcheting up the policy to increase the amount of auditing and watching your resource consumption on the API server side um, you know, is not a bad thing to do. That way you can sort of get a sense for um, you know, where the diminishing returns are. If you, you know, if you basically log everything, it's gonna be you know, crazy. You know, you know, every byte in is gonna be magnified by two because you're gonna be writing it to the audit log with a bunch of extra metadata. So, um, you know, kind of getting a sense for um, the, the throughput capabilities of your system in, and the memory capabilities is gonna be important. Memory is a, a key piece of the puzzle because the, um, the, the API server's audit subsystem is gonna um, capture, you know, various um, context and other types of information about all this um, logging, um, audit logging output. And in many cases, you'll wanna be buffering um, your output as we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, watching memory utilization of your server and also the IO uh, consumption of your server to whatever kind of back end you're using for capturing the audit information. So how do we um, set up the API server? Well, the API server has 30 audit logging options. And um, the most important one is perhaps audit policy file. And so that's the file to actually use um, to, uh, to, to define your audit policy. And a lot of times when people um, you know, start thinking about you know, this, this file, um, it, you, 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 can, you can put it in a bunch of different places, but at the end of the day, um, in a kubeadm scenario, you would probably put it in a protected directory and then you would host path mount it into the um, API server container. That would be a, a typical scenario. Um, so the next thing that we've got, and let me just, maybe I'll just show you a quick example of that. So let's come back over here and uh, let me um, just dump out the, the manifest that's running our API server. So 
And so you can see this guy, um, this guy's got a host path for var log audit. Um, that's where the log output is going, but the audit, the, the policy file also, as it turns out, is there. And a lot of times the policy file would be in Etsy Kubernetes or something like that. But um, there's the mount path inside the container. So it's the same as the host. And then in the configuration of the API server, so we run the Kube API server in our configuration, we specify the audit log path, and then we have the policy. So um, those are two key configurations. And you can run the Kubernetes API server with a minus minus help. And that'll dump out all the switches, and there are a lot. Um, and you can also, you know, use the documentation for reference if you want to. But this is a, a complete list of the, the current with Kubernetes 119.3 um, audit log uh, options. Now, if you want to, you have two possible backends for the, um, the API servers audit logging. One of them is a local file, or it doesn't have to be local, a file. Um, and then the other one would be a webhook. And so there's a posting protocol for the webhook to receive all the events. And in either scenario, um, there are lots of settings, right? So these are all the log settings. These apply to a, a file-based um, log output where regular file IO would be what the API server was doing. And these are the webhooks where it would be uh, an HTTP um, you know, post style um, output. Um, so that's the, um, you know, the basic configuration stuff. So now, let's, now that we kind of got an idea, of audit logging, we've seen some events, we know how to configure servers, we understand this policy thing. Um, what are some of the concerns um, that you run into in practice with this? Well, one of the first things that you run into is having multiple API servers because nobody in a production environment is gonna have one API server because the API server goes down, your cluster's dead. Two is probably fine um, for most clusters. You get, you know, that way if one of them goes down, you still have the other one and, you know, it's, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna lose two. And, and when you add API servers, you, you get some scaling ability, right? Because the logic being processed by the API servers is you know, now distributed. But really at the end of the day, you know, maybe I just go back here to this previous model. At the end of the day, the bottleneck is etcd. So um, etcd is an in-memory key value store. This is why the audit log is not going here, right? It would totally, etcd is already a bottleneck just keeping up with the, the 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 configuration of the cluster right and the events that are happening because those you know the eight you know control plane level events those events are actually being stored in etcd for a period of time um, but the audit log data that's massive so we have to have a completely different channel totally independent um, for the you know the the audit log and when you think about this um, etcd is, is is often in a production system running on a different cluster. So you would have a, you know, a three, you know, well in production, you probably have a five or a seven node etcd cluster. And so, you know, the API server uh, cardinality is independent of etcd if you're, if you're not running them on the same box, right? So a, a collapsed etcd API server where the etcd nodes are running on the same machines as the API servers is, is an okay way to do things. But if you're doing things in that way, then what defines the number of API servers you have is the etcd cluster size not the API, you know, not the API servers. Two API servers is fine for high availability for most clusters. Um, but here's a problem. Um, when you have multiple API servers, and let's say you have three, you're gonna need a load balancer. And so um, you might set up, you know, a, a, if you're using a Google Cloud, you might use a network load balancer on Amazon or something. Um, Google Cloud use their load balancer, Azure use their load balancer. Um, to basically front end your API servers and all your, your, your kubectl configs are going to refer to the, um, the TCP load balancer. And so they hit this guy, he just forwards the traffic on to one of these API servers and you don't know the difference, but there's a health check so that when one of these guys crashes, they only send you to the guys that are alive. Well, that's great, but the downside is you don't know which one of these guys is gonna be dumping out the audit log information that you're interested in. So um, you could do something like run a pod, as you can see down here, and then, you know, tail the audit log looking for, you know, some sort of pod activity and not see it because you're looking at the wrong audit log, right? And you, you, you came in here and hit this guy and this guy logged the activity and these two logs don't have anything about it. So the API servers are shared nothing, right? They're microservices. They don't know, you know, what's going on in the other server. Um, they're really focused on, you know, being as independent as possible. So the downside is 
your audit log is um, now sharded basically. And so to unshard it, you're gonna do something like run a, a Fluent D or a log stash or a beat or a, a, a Fluent bit or something like that to Splunk you know, forward or something to move that log data into a back end where you can get a complete picture of what's going on in the cluster. And so that's important. Um, another thing about these distributed um, you know, API servers is that on the upside, you get scaling, right? So if you've got you know, huge throughput going on in your audit log, you just divided it by three by having three API servers. And so that, you know, as long as your network can, can handle it and you've got, you know, the bandwidth um, on, the, on the actual wire, you're, you're using three NICs, you're using three sets of memories, you're using three sets of disk, whatever the case may be, you, you've really got scale there. So this is one way in which actually having multiple API servers can in fact have a dramatic impact on your scaling challenges. Um, because if you're not using audit logging, um, you know, I mean, one API server can handle a pretty honking big cluster. It's the etcd cluster that's always the bottleneck. And so, um, you know, two API servers is good for HA, three is even better. But, you know, if you had audit log challenges, you might want to go to four or five and, you know, get your audit log scaled out, um, you know, using, using more API servers. And remember, the cardinality could be completely different from the etcd cluster because, you know, usually that's a separate cluster of, of servers. Um, another thing people often, um, you know, stub their toe on for a day or two is um, using config maps. Config maps are awesome for configuring things. And you might say, hey, I'm running the API server in a pod. Why don't I uh, set up the policy as a config map? Y you could, but what happens when you start the cluster? There's no API servers running and you fire up the first API server. And for him to configure himself, he needs a config map. Well, how are you going to get that config map? you need to make a request to an API server that's gonna hit etcd and give you the config map, but there's no API servers. There's a chicken and egg problem. So um, most people skip that and you know, do some other te technique to um, standardize their policies. But this is another pitfall, right? What if API server one has one policy and server two has a different policy and server three has a different policy? I mean, there, there could be excuses for doing that. It is totally possible, but um, it's gonna give you weird, asymmetric log output, right, from the different servers. So in most cases, um, at least that I've run across, you probably want them to be the same. And you might want to have some, you know, sort of immutable infrastructure, Ansible, salt, you know, whatever type thingy that's, you know, keeping those files in sync or, or have them from a shared disk, you know, or something. Um, so next thing to talk about, we've got a few more things here. I know I think we have to wrap up, but um, I'll, I'll try to hit a couple more things here and then we'll see if we can get get some time for questions. So mutating admission controller webhooks. Um, it can be useful to know which mutating webhook mutated an object in an API request. And if you've got a, you know, if you've got a bunch of plugins into the uh, API server that are um, potentially changing the nature of a resource that somebody created, um, by default, the API server won't know anything about it, right? It's going to call these guys and, um, you know, it's, it's, they do what they do, and then the, the, the API server just you know, moves on to the next um, unit in the chain. And so what we want to be able to do is see where in the chain you know, change A happened and where in the ch chain change B happened. So a popular example would be Istio, for example, and the um, Istio um, proxy injector. So I create a pod. I'm oblivious. I just you know, wrote my app, and I put it in a pod, and I, I go to deploy it. And now the... Um, the API server says, "Oh, we have a we have a um, you know a, a mutating um, admission controller here that wants to mess with this pod. And what is he going to do? He's going to add to the pod of, of an init container that's going to rewire all of the traffic in the pod, and then he's going to add a sidecar for the proxy, which is going to um, intercept all the outbound traffic from the main container, and he's going to then you know TLS encrypt it and do MTLS and and the tracing data and whatever else he's going to do. But that um, mutation is fairly complex and it could interact in weird ways with other mutations. And it becomes hard to sort of figure out what's going on unless you have some way to introspect. And this is exactly what um, um, mutating admission controller webhooks can do by using annotations. And so you can see in the example here, um, mutation webhook admission controller Kates.io, round one index two. So if, if you're familiar with um, admission controllers, we have you know, different phases. So round one, 
um, is is uh, the first pass. Um, but then we once everything's mutated, you might also have um, you know a, a, an admission controller that's going to allow or disallow only. Um, and so um, that that um, admission controller you know would come up in another round. And so we have these different rounds, and then we have the indexes. So in this case, we're the the second of the um, of the mutating um, controllers. And so we have the configuration. And we specify some configuration data. We have the webhook information, and then we have the status of whether this guy mutated it or not. So in this case, um, this this controller did not um, mutate the resource, and so that's a, a a nice you know piece of documentation that you can now get from your system. You can you can see you know if you're mucking around with admission controllers, you can really look in and get a deep dive into what's going on. Um, another thing um, that we can do is we can specify the actual mutation. And so if you have a request level um, you know, audit or higher, um, this is all you'll get, uh, by the way, um, if you are just at metadata um, level. So just yes or no, I mutated this object. But if you're at request level or higher, which is more detailed, then as you can see, we get the patch, right? And so you actually have the, um, you know, the, the, the information about how things were changed, which is, um, you know, really really can be useful again in, in debugging scenarios okay so i think a couple more things and then, then we'll wrap up here um so audit log monitoring um the um the api server it has two um open metrics style metrics endpoints um or metrics uh metrics uh in its slash metrics endpoint and one of them is api server audit event total so that's the cumulative total of audit events and then there's API server audit error total. So that's the total number of events that were dropped due to an error in exporting. So we haven't talked about this just yet, but if you're if you're you know dumping huge amounts of information to a back end, uh, like a, an Elasticsearch or a Fluentd aggregator or something, and you're overwhelming it um, with IOs, one way to fix that problem is to batch a bunch of events together and do a single IO with a collection of events. And so you can reduce the number of IOs by a factor of 10 by just collecting every 10 events and submitting them as a unit. And that often solves problems. Uh, another thing that you can have is you can have, you know, sort of um, up and down, you know, performance in these aggregators because they might be servicing lots of other, you know, log streams. And so you might need to buffer your output. You might send them a batch and then a whole other batch and another batch and another batch. You might have five or six batches waiting. And then as soon as they process that first one, then they might catch up. So you need to sort of look at what the lag is and figure out a buffer size that also works for them. And so if you end up running out of buffer, you're going to drop events. And this will tell you if you're doing that. So those are both really important because the first one, event total, is going to give you an ability to sort of estimate and, and discover spikes. So if you have a Prometheus or something system monitoring the metrics from your API server, you can plot that and look for anomalies or trends You know, if, if you're increasing continually. Um, day after day, you might want to make sure you've got the headroom to get to where you're going to need to be in a month. And then errors, of course, are always nice to know about. So this is just an example dump running a kubectl proxy on a machine because, you know, to avoid all the TLS stuff that you need to get the metrics. And then just curling um, the proxy to get through to the API server on the metrics endpoint. Um, and you can see that we've got um, the audit event in this case is what we're grepping for, uh, the total. And you could pull up the error in the same way. So that's some of the metrics. Um, other things, um, handling massive throughput. So we talked about batching, blocking, and, um, and strict blocking. Um, batching um, is where you're going to buffer events asynchronously. Blocking, you're going to actually block the API server responses until the event is processed. So that, that's, you know, that's pretty draconian uh, and will impact users. Um, and then blocking strict is the same as blocking, but when there's a failure during the audit logging, the, the whole request is rejected to the user. So that's even more strict. So um, batch is you know, typically what, what people would set to for their um, the buffering strategy. And then there's a you know, buffer sizes, wait times, um, throttling, all sorts of things that you can set up here um, to help control the throughput. Um, other considerations, um, remember that each API server is independent, shared nothing. Um, and so um, scaling them can, can give you some scale. Um, so if your backend webhook is the bottleneck, you're going to have to think about that as well. But you can scale the API servers to scale the stuff out. 
Okay, um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of time here. So I'll wrap up. Um, thanks a bunch. Um, really appreciate your time and uh, maybe we'll, we'll uh, see about some questions. Okay, well, thank you, Randy, for that excellent presentation. We have about five minutes for questions. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, please drop it into the Q&A box. The first question here, is the JSON output formatted according to CADF specifications? Uh, that is a good question. Um, the types um, go source is the, the, you know, defines the structure. So I'm not positive. I'll, 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 uh, I'll see if I can um, find out though. And, and maybe I can um, post a, an answer with a, a follow up in the, when we, uh, when we upload things. Not a problem. Does anybody else have a question they would like to ask? We have a few moments, so please feel free to ask away. Would you be able to elaborate a bit more on the relation between an API server and XD? Sure. Um, okay, let me, uh, let me back up here to this picture. So um, the, the XD cluster, um, let's see if I And see if I could draw something, um, but I don't think. Uh, oh, yeah, I can. Here we go. I use so many different darn uh, presentation tools these days. I have to keep track. Um, so, if you have an etcd cluster, let's say, let's do it simple. Let's just keep uh, an example of three. Um, that etcd cluster with three nodes is going to um, use the raft uh, consensus protocol to elect a leader. And so, let's say this guy's the leader. So if you've got, um, let's say three, let's say you've got five of these guys just to make it a little bit more interesting. So say you've got five etcd nodes and you've got three API servers. So the API servers are all going to write to the leader. And in general, they're gonna read from the leader too. And you might say, oh my God, that's terrible because the more API servers you add, the more load you're creating on that leader. And while that's true, at the end of the day, um, the etcd cluster is highly consistent. When you write to the leader, it has to write that data to all of the other nodes in the cluster. And furthermore, because it's a highly consistent key value store, it has to know that a quorum of the nodes have um, committed the data. And so um, etcd becomes the bottleneck in most cases when you're, um, when you're you know, experiencing control plane challenges. And so the, um, you know, the API servers are, are uh, they're anonymous, faceless, identityless microservices. You put a load balancer in front of them, you hit the load balancer, you don't care which one you get. Because no matter which one you talk to, it's always gonna give you the same picture of the world because you have this highly consistent key value store that stores all the state. No, the API servers have some you know, caching and things like that, but at the end of the day, everything comes from etcd. So if you ask number one, two, or three of those masters what pods are out there, um, they're all gonna give you the same answer. And so the, the state in etcd is, uh, is, is the, the, the real you know, bottleneck, the management of that. And uh, unfortunately, adding more nodes to etcd slows it down. The fastest etcd cluster is a single node because he doesn't have to copy the data to anybody. And so the reason that you need to have multiple nodes and that production systems are like usually five or seven is that if you, um, for example, want you know, diversity and, and failure tolerance, resilience, which you want, you know, in most cases, you can have three availability zones, for example, in the cloud, and you can run your etcd cluster across all three. And if you lose any AZ, you still have a quorum, right? Quorum is n over two greater than. So if in this case, five over two, that's two and a half. So three would be the next higher integer. So any three of these guys, and we're good. So we could lose a whole AZ, or if a node crashes, you can, um, and you, let's say you take a node down for maintenance, you can still have another node crash and be okay. 
Um, seven is a little bit safer than that, but it's a little bit slower. So um, that's sort of the relationship, right? Stateless microservices, the API server, usually behind a load balancer, like this would be like a Kubernetes service sort of, right? Um, but in the case of, a load, of API servers, you'd usually use not always, but usually use something else because you want people to be able to access the cluster who are not in it. And so, um, you know, services, um, a load balancer service, you know, you know, could make sense. But again, you, you, you got to worry about chicken and egg problems when you're creating resources in the cluster to, to access the API server. The API server is the thing that gives you access to those resources. So usually some sort of external load balancer in front of the API servers and then the API servers communicating with the leader of the etcd cluster and the etcd cluster leadership is dynamic so all the api servers are, are typically going to know about all the etcd servers um, so hopefully that answers the question thank you very much randy and i want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation um, unfortunately we are out of time um, i would like to thank everybody for joining us today and um, as i said before today's uh, webinar and Slides from today's presentation will be available on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you again, Randy, for a wonderful presentation. Um, everybody take care, stay safe, and we will see you at the next CNCF webinar. Thanks everybody.